Hi, my name is Mattia Murray, and welcome to The Longer Road. You are on The Longer Road if you have multiple intersectional identities that are often marginalized. You've had to work harder to get to the starting line, and you might feel behind. I'm here to provide hope, support, and practical tips, and to let you know that you're not alone. Welcome to today's guest, Mary Grace Allardyce. She is she does a lot of things. I found her, uh, originally I heard her on Amelia Hruby's podcast about leaving social media. I can't remember the exact title of that podcast right now. And then I knew Mary Grace had a podcast. So I went and started listening to that and also fantastic. So I'll definitely have her talk about that and put that link in the show notes. And I just, I love Mary Grace's energy and everything she's putting out there in the world. I just knew that she definitely had some lovely things to share. So I'm very excited to have her here and I will have her introduce herself a little bit more officially. I love that you pointed to me for the official introduction, whereas normally when I'm introducing myself, I sort of just get kind of like sweaty and spread out. So I'll do my best to make it official. But I would say that I'm primarily an artist in how I approach the world and myself and what I find meaningful. I tend to approach things primarily as how they can be creative and new and feel like they're they're meeting something that wants to get made. Making is very much my primary mode in the world. And within that, I have a podcast called The Homebody Podcast, and I do a lot of different things. I am an astrologer. I do sort of like ceremony sessions for people where we do the energetic practices or energetic healing modalities um, in addition to astrology or whatever sort of a a spirit-oriented session feels like is needed for people. And then in the past few months, I've also started doing uh, what I call third house things, which is really helping people with their internal workflows and processes inside of Notion. So doing custom Notion builds and sort of trying to, as much as possible, allow our digital landscapes to respond and reflect our natural systems um, so that we work better and more holistically. So I think that's that's probably the, the wide view, the wide scope um, about what how I'm showing up right now and today. Lovely. Thank you so much. And what are you passionate about right now? I know you probably just touched on some of them, but what's really present for you today? That's such a, a good question. And for someone who is exceptionally multi-passionate, also a really hard one to answer. I'm very much in love with uh, home. I'm very much in love with my animals, the dogs that I am so lucky to live with and mother. Um, gardening, books, I'm really obsessed with and all things like biomimicry, but a little bit more, a little bit less scientifically minded than biomimicry, a little bit about what being in and working with our hands in the dirt and how that teaches us to be alive as people and how that is also an extension of our embodiment. Um, all things interstellar, I'm kind of like really, <laughs> aliens have sort of become this like philosophy in my mind in the past few years. So I'm kind of passionate about that. What am I not passionate about? Might be an easier question. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, uh, I feel like we'll talk about many things uh, throughout the conversation today, and I'll probably be passionate about all of them. Um, I've really also am learning learning a lot more about neurodivergence and sensitivity and things that I've always just sort of like used casually or noticed casually about myself, and I'm really learning to dive into those a little bit more, understand them better, just also appreciate them in a more intentional way. Um, and also educating myself as to how I can give myself what I need a little bit better from day to day. Oh, that is lovely. And I imagine that a lot of that sort of home focused, rich or uh, routine focused things you were mentioning, you know, for a lot of neurodivergent people, that is so important because our home base is what helps us feel safe. Uh -huh. Very much. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that journey right now with how you're thinking about neurodivergence, sensitivity kind of, and, and what you're doing to support yourself around that? Yeah. I think a lot of it for me is I'm just keep being invited to new layers of acceptance around things. And also it can be really helpful 
for me, I'm reading a book right now called The Divergent Mind, um, which is sort of helping with a lot of things. And a common realization that the people she's interviewing have are like, well, I thought everyone was like this. You know, like we don't notice things because we think that, well, everyone's having the same experience as us. Like everyone freaks out about the grocery store. Doesn't everyone lose their mind if something in their planned daily routine gets like subverted? No, they actually don't. (laughs) So, uh, and those are funny because those are things that my partner and I frequently get into tiffs about because I'll just kind of lose my shit if like I thought the day was going to go one way like and something comes up and he's just kind of it feels to me like he's not taking something seriously about and it just to me I kind of melt down a little bit and I have to recover which has always been a thing for me but I just hmm, I thought it was something that I needed to like I thought it was something that was wrong with me um, as opposed to something I can like care for a little bit better and also inform people about so that they can just understand that it affects me a little bit differently than it affects them. And the sensitivity, I know I've known I've had synesthesia for a really long time. Um, and also, I mean, even from a very young age, people were like, wow, she's really sensitive. Like, wow, she really just like bursts into tears for no reason for a really long time. Like these are things that have always been associated with me, but not really. Um, and now really being able to tar- to notice more when I'm being over, when I'm overstimulated and how that's affecting me. Whereas before I would just, I would feel sort of like I'm getting at a, an edge or a level and I need to like shut down, go home immediately, or I'm going to be like crying in a bathroom somewhere, um, <laughs> regardless of what country I'm in or what time it is. Relatable. Yeah. Really relatable. Um, I think Erica Sanchez just came out with a memoir called crying in bathrooms oh my and God. I haven't read it yet, but I'm going to, I was like, wow, this is also the hashtag for my life. So just also noticing like what are those things that sort of build up that feel like I'm being overstimulated as opposed to like I'm just emotional or I'm just a woman or I'm just whatever we sort of write it off with and just getting a little more um, awareness around what some of the triggers are for that, how I can be a little bit better about minimizing those for myself and just giving myself what I need. Um, I've been very lucky to curate a really amazing friend family to where – I forget sometimes that I have a very sort of non-mainstream life uh, because I'm around um, people who love me and know me and also feel very sensitive and queer and like marginal and creative. And uh, I forget that that's not always the norm until sometimes you're like, I have to go to the Apple store and I'm in the middle of a mall and I'm like, oh my God, (laughs) I guess if this is what's normal, then I'm very not normal. Where do all these normal people live? I know. exactly. (laughs) Where do they come from? And what are, oh, I definitely look a little funny, Um, you know, but... (laughs) Uh, that was sort of a, an a linear uh, question, uh, a la- li- non-linear answer to your question, but mm-hmm. and also for me, I think leaning into how these are gifts um, that they're not, um, yeah, they're gifts, and that it's really an injustice to force people and force children and at all ages to thrive inside of a system that's really lacking a lot of aliveness. And then when they're not thriving to say, there's something wrong with you, Mm. feels profoundly unfair and unjust. And I'm really leaning into how these are, these are all gifts and these are just how humans are. And there is nothing wrong with us. We just need to challenge the world to stretch towards being something where we would thrive because that world would more likely be better and more resilient. Yeah. And better for everyone. I I keep saying, you know, when every time I do any work around accessibility, Mm -hmm. usually accessibility for any type of person, any, any type of disability makes the space better for everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, having, I don't know, just like there's so many, now I don't want to go down that, that road entirely. Just this idea that like when we're building a world that works for us, it's typically better for everyone, just having options. I also, I would really love to hear again, a little bit more about this, potentially this journey that you've had from feeling like there was something wrong with you to this, what sounds like a really deep acceptance, or at least like a journey of acceptance. And what helped you get there? I think so many things. Um, Part of it is like practicing what I preach. I think 
you know, if we do client work or we hold space for other people, a lot of times things kind of come through for the people that you're holding space for. And as you're saying it or sharing it, you're like, oh, I definitely need that as well, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Yep, yep. So that is a really helpful practice. And I think also being in a really stable, beautiful partnership has been really healing for me, not feeling like I have to be perfect in order to be accepted, but sort of like my wildness and unruliness in some ways is something that's like celebrated and beautiful and has really given me a lot of space to just own more things about myself and also feel loved and accepted that way. I know we're supposed to be like self-love, self-love and like, yes, we are, but I think sometimes that can be harmful when it can be used to make people feel bad as if they're not loving themselves enough because I, um, Mm -hmm. because I think we, we are made to be loved by other people unconditionally. Yeah. And to, to say, well, you just need to love yourself more when people aren't experiencing that. I think there's something kind of missing there. And also I just think my friend, I I'm so lucky. Like my friends are my family in such a big way. I'm so in love with all of them. They are, (laughs) I love all of them so much. And there's just the way that just like being, being weird is just so celebrated, not being weird for the sake of being weird, but just like truly being yourself, truly being like, I got to go to bed at grandma time. I was actually researching this, this, and this today and inventing a job around this. And that just being sort of normal and held has really helped me. And also feeling resonance. The more people share, allowing myself to feel resonance with whom that is true, allowing myself to really love what it is that I love. Um, and how I love it. You know, listening, I you always feel a really deep resonance when I hear writers talk. I'm just like, whoa, this is totally like, yeah, I just wandered through the forest all day and like wrote some poems. And then that was my name. Like that is really what I need to be about, <laughs> you know, and just knowing that that's a viable life. This is someone that people celebrate their work. And like, you know, who doesn't know Mary Oliver? You know, even people who don't like poetry are in love with Mary Oliver. It's just someone who really stuck to their guns and was like, this is what I got to do to be alive. And it's amazing. I'm not saying Mary Oliver was no diversion. I don't know. But just seeing other people craft and curate lives that suit them and also generate their best work that literally moves the world. And just allowing myself to sort of respond to little twinges of resonance. They're like, oh yeah, I really relate to what they're saying. Or, oh, I didn't know you could make a job where you could like not have to talk all day or things like that. And just letting those things be resonant just reveal to me where I have desires or where there's gaps or where there's needs. Um, And also where there can be impact on my terms, I think, um, which again, just feeds that sense of there's nothing wrong with you, right? There's something that you are uniquely here to embody and bring into the world. And whatever that thing is, is completely perfect. And it's honestly, the more we stray from that, I think where we start to suffer. So, or where I start to suffer, I should just speak for myself. So, um, those are the things that have really helped me the most, I think. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. And again, my brain is just going in a ton of directions. (laughs) Me too. I actually had one little experience recently with um, someone that I had on the podcast a little while back, Lex Ritchie. Mm-hmm. They do these, uh, well, they do, again, a bunch of things, but they do these ancestral tarot readings. And I signed up for one. And of course, I didn't read the fine print because I just didn't. Yeah. And then I signed in on the day and I was like, oh, this is not a, a live call. They recorded themselves doing the whole reading and then sent it to me. Mm-hmm. And it was, I was just like, that's fucking brilliant. Mm-hmm. Like for, again, what you were just saying, like building a life that works for you. It's like, you don't have to build work or sessions or art that looks like the way you've seen other people do it. And that's both incredibly liberating and incredibly terrifying Mm -hmm. because every time you step out and do something just like in a different way that you've never seen anybody do before, there has to be a certain amount of, I guess, conviction or maybe confidence behind it that this is just what you're doing. And it can be really hard to, I think, to develop that. I think I'm getting there. Yeah. I mean, it can be exhausting too, to just feel like you have to Mm. constantly be a pathfinder and you're like, can't someone just make a path for me? And I do some like boring thing for a while (laughs) that just works. You know, it's, it can be really hard Mm -hmm. to just feel like you've always got to like blaze the trail, build the ship, get in the ship, find the map, draw the map. Like it can be a lot. (laughs) And so I think there's some, can be some unnamed tiredness there. Um, Mm as well. But I really love that example. I think that's, that's really perfect. Yeah. And so now that you're, you know, have built to a great degree, a life that works for you, when you have those, uh, 
you know, maybe it's noticing that you're tired or noticing that there's not as much resonance as you like. Like, what do you look for in your life to know that you need to change things? Mm, like, wh- where do I notice the friction? Yeah. Or how I notice it? Um, hmm. I start to feel really tired all the time. I'm a little, I'm really short. I start to notice that I'm really angry. I'm borderline angry and frustrated and tired. My body will start to get sick actually. And for me, a lot of times it's when I've been in too much output, which can kind of sneak up on me because I'm very much a maker. Like I just can't help, but just like make things kind of all the time. Um, and I love being in that zone. Um, but there's a mix for me. Like I have to use structure to sort of um, pull things out of me in a, in a productive way sometimes, but there can be a point where there's too much of it. And I start to feel like really boxed in and really tired and really like rebellious and resentful. I would say maybe resentful tends to get to be the loudest thing that lets me know that there's some friction. And the number one thing that normally I need to do, like for myself, it's like morning time needs to be restored. Because when I'm excited about something, I'll sort of be like, I just want to get up and start working on it immediately and blah. And for a while that can be nurturing, but then once it starts to feel like work, it no longer feels nurturing necessarily. And so for me, having time in the morning where I can sort of check into my own experience, my own what feels like spiritual alignment to me, embodied alignment, et cetera, that really can hold me so much throughout the day. And when I don't have the, just that simple orientation time, sometimes it's just me reading a book that really feels like it lights me up right now. Um, it doesn't always have to be like completely like wild and ritualistic, which sometimes it is. But when I don't have that time in the morning before the day starts to really connect with myself in the quiet, then things start to go kind of awry for me pretty quickly. Usually what I need is quiet space and alone time, um, mostly alone time. Yeah, if I'm starting to feel the resentful yeah. because I can then from there get clarity about what needs to shift as opposed to feeling kind of tossed about. So totally. Yeah. What is your relationship with receiving? That is something I'm really, 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 really on the front burner for me right now. Cause there's kind of, there's some things that I've been dealing with health wise that have really, when I kind of look at the theme of it, which as I go to acupuncture, which has helped me so much throughout the course of my life um, with a lot of different things that felt like they would never go away or get better or anything. A theme that kind of, but it's an, I like the way that it can A, address physical things, but B, offer some kind of poetic language for how we could think about the energy of what's happening in our body as well. And receiving is a big thing. (laughs) It's a really big part of it. It's like, And I think that there's a way, obviously all of us know how to receive, but I think sometimes we'll get into either seasons of life or moments in life where we're being called to learn to receive more, which means we have to be able to hold more. Um, And for me, that's also connected to just not being overwhelmed. Like what does it look like to hold more without it being overwhelming? What does it look like to um, maintain a level of simplicity and beauty, but also have like more fullness? Um, What does fullness mean to me? How does it feel in my body? What in my body is clenched so that it actually cannot take things in, which is sort of how I'm really working with it right now. So it's something that I'm really leaning into in an ongoing way. And for me, there's a really big, my default will be to overgive because I love I love giving. Um, But I've noticed for me too, even just some things I've learned from business, that when there is lack of clarity for me in what an exchange is, I tend to fill any potential lack of clarity with overgiving. I'll be like, oh, this actually wasn't clarified. Let me give a little bit extra. And I've seen that in myself a few distinct times in particular this year. And so now trying to really craft things and get more yeah, using it as a prompt for more clarity so that I can get better at receiving from back where I need to be, um, as opposed to always having to push forward or feel like I have to shout, which I probably am not going to do, and um, or be flashier or give more in order to like prove a sense of value, but sort of certainly be able to just sit where I need to be and with who I am and establish the clarity I need to feel safe to receive, I think is a really big part of it for me. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, the, this is resonating very much with also where I'm at and how I think. So this is very interesting to me. I had um, 
sort of a mystical experience lately where I was really sort of my intention going into that experience was really bringing forward some things, some areas where I felt stuck and that I keep like pushing up against a wall or really sort of thrashing against it. And my experience in that was just really a, I experienced a tremendous sense of loosening in my body <laughs> and being like, oh, I was very clenched around literally everything, um, which would make sense why nothing was changing or moving or shifting. And something I really saw, and again, it's something because, you know, I live with my partner and we just, you know, we're very close. And so all of our shit is on each other all the time. Like if there is any shit, we've got it and we're sharing it together. And something I really noticed in that experience was that me not receiving makes my partner have to work harder. Me feeling guilty about what they want to give for to me and how they want to give, it blocks the thing. Um, it's like if there's an infinity symbol and then on one loop, someone's like, no, don't give that to me. You block the whole infinity symbol. It can't move anymore. So there was a way that that understanding was a lot for me. It's like, I think I'm doing someone a favor being like, no, I feel really guilty if you give this to me and like, I don't deserve it. But that actually blocks the whole loop of what we're giving and receiving together. And so really making that self-satisfaction or that, um, the reciprocity of receiving something that is not an option. Like if you want this dynamic to work, you have to really open that up and just say yes to it instead of letting your guilt or your shame or your sense of unworthiness get in the way. Yeah. And sometimes that is uncomfortable on our side, right? Oh, like sure. the, I mean, you're describing that exactly, that it's like we are choosing to allow ourselves to be a little bit uncomfortable to receive mm -hmm. because that is a gift to the other person, mm -hmm. especially if someone's offering you a gift or a compliment or something that could be a stretch for them to give as well. Mm -hmm. And if it's met with anything other than just like open, excited gratitude, that kind of sucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're trying to give someone something and they're just like, no, I don't deserve it. Which is sort of, I don't know, that's often the feeling underneath it for me is like, no, I don't, I don't deserve it. I don't, or I don't need it just because I'm so used to meeting my own needs and not receiving in a lot of ways. Again, that's also something I've been working on, you know, for past few years, especially, but that was definitely how, like my entire 20s was just like, I don't need anything. Yeah. I'll do everything myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So I I wrote down in all caps, the term exceptionally multi-passionate. I love that so much because <laughs> same. And I would love to hear anything you want to share around, you know, how you, and I don't even love the word balance, honestly, but how you choose what you want to focus on kind of in the present or like, do you think in terms of like longer cycles? I'm just really curious how you work with all these various talents and interests. I think for me, a lot of it really grounds in time for me in order for me to not feel overwhelmed. And what I mean by that is sort of having, even if every day is not the same, I, it's like I, in my mind, I have these little boxes that like, I like to get checked every day. And if that's happening, I feel, and I do have a preferred order that they get checked in. And when that's happening, I feel great. And so it's not that like, oh, I'm probably not going to have time to work on Japanese for 60 minutes every day. Like that's not realistic. And so that's requiring me, A, to soften my expectations. I don't have to be some like perfect triple A student in order for something to matter. And B, um, how can I just think of it? I have like a block of experimental time each day. And these are the things that I'm pulling from, as opposed to thinking I have to do everything every day. I have to touch each of the things I care about every day in order for them to stay real, which is something that I see with other people. Like when I'm, especially when I'm helping them with like notion things and project management things like that can be a place where people get kind of sticky um, is when we feel if something else isn't holding it for us, we feel like we have to be touching it all the time for it to stay close. And so yeah, I think a lot of it for me is just grounded in this sense of routine. Um, and I like to make schedules a lot. And But my schedules are not necessarily like from 8.15 to 8.55, I do this. It's more like here's a chunk of time. And from this chunk of time, you can pull from sort of these – <laughs> this outer circle of things that you're interested in. And then during sort of the power hours of the day or the places where I feel most accessible, most creative, most awake, um, those need to get dedicated to these particular things. Um, so I think for me, knowing how to prioritize my time is really, really, really valuable. Obviously, I have a lot of things I do 
that equal work. And those things need to be tended to, tending to clients um, and letting myself teach myself, like, I, when do I feel anxiety? If I feel anxious, if I haven't touched this, if it's like, oh, I need to respond to client emails, at least one sweep every day, or I'm going to go to sleep at night feeling anxious. And um, and letting that inform how often I have to touch something, um, how to form the next day. And so now it actually just feels really natural. It's like, okay, in the morning I get up, I have coffee. I do these little creative things that help me feel alive. They wake up my brain. I can kind of trick myself into working because I feel really inspired. And then I sort of tumble in, which is true. Um, and then I um, trickle into working. And then in the middle of the day, I do sort of admin tasks and things that I don't really care about that much. And then after that, just like letting myself spread out like, oh, actually, I would like to like work on some embroidery or actually I would like to work on some Japanese or I would like to do this. And I think I do have a threshold for how many things I keep close at any given time, but I, I haven't actually consciously done that. I would say that there, as far as fringe interests and things that I'm super passionate about at any particular time, there's probably like max four because I get really obsessed with things that I get really excited about and I go all in and I have to go really deep. I want to know everything about it really embody it and so when the first the first onrush of something I'm passionate about coming in it takes up a lot more space and then after I feel like I've gone down in the submarine really taken it all in and come back to the surface it can sort of occupy a more outer layer that I don't touch as frequently um, so I would say things are sort of always moving in and out like the ocean sort of depending on what the current obsessions are and I think having outlets like a podcast or having creative mediums, those are really valuable for me because they force me to – they don't force me. Hmm. They are opportunities for me to really integrate and synthesize things like, oh, how do these seemingly non-related passions work together? What do they teach each other about each other? Um, and that is a space that I really like to hover in, which I think – is again, another gift that I think people who are multi-passionate can bring is that sense of connection across seemingly disparate or non-related things, um, as opposed to perhaps maybe a more tunnel vision where we only know, and none of them is bad, none, none are better than the other, but I do think sort of the, the margins, those sort of wide meeting intersections can be a really valuable thing. And I find that for me being exceptionally multi-passionate, that's kind of a space that I'm always interested in and living in. That was long-winded, sorry. No, I love it. Uh, again, it's just you you say so many things that I resonate with. So I also jotted down the note, digital landscapes reflecting natural landscapes. Like that is something I've been thinking about in particular because I'm going to be taking the winter off of social media. I've taken breaks before. I'm just kind of figuring out what my relationship is to it right now. Mm -hmm. But that's exactly why I'm doing it. I know that winter for me is this more fallow period. I'm still usually producing, but it's like much more quiet. Yeah. It's just kind of, you know, writing and not necessarily publishing, putting stuff out as much. Uh, it feels a little bit more private and inwardly focused. And that's just part of my own natural rhythm. And I would love to hear more about, uh, I guess, like how you stumbled across or got into that idea. And then how you work with Notion? Because I've used Notion a bit, but I've never heard of anybody doing what you're doing. I love that question and all those observations. Congratulations for taking winter off of social media. I will be anyone's number one cheerleader in doing that. Um, and you know, also congratulations if you're listening to this and not doing that. It's totally fine. In 2020, in March of 2020, one of the first things we did was build a bunch of raised beds in our backyard and started gardening. I come from a long line of very poor country mountain farmers in Tennessee. And so sort of growing up and being on farms and in the country and like in real close relation to things that were like being grown. It's like, oh, we want potatoes. We got to go out and like dig them up. You want eggs for breakfast? We got to go out and get them. And um, so growing up, at least within my periphery, um, with that being a reality is something that I've always felt very close to. And I definitely romanticized growing up um, and really loved. And so we started gardening or, and I found that it was just a very healing thing for me. It was really putting me in direct relationship to the outer world in a way that was really helpful. Um, it was also corresponding to um, a time where I was doing some copywriting for a microbiome researcher. And so I was doing a lot of nerding out on the microbiome 
strong recommend um, <laughs> if anyone just needs a topic. So interesting. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. It will completely change how you view reality. And so all of that was really converging um, at once for me. And at the same time, noticing that my work and a lot of people's work at that time was becoming a lot more digital, um, a lot more time on screens, a lot more time on Zoom, um, and just really noticing both of those things happening at once. And for me, you know, I was always like in the back of the car growing up and like my car seat being like, why did they just cut down all those trees to build a new shitty neighborhood? And in that way, feeling pro very deeply connected to the more than human world from a very young age. And so all the things around climate crisis and extinction and things like that and um, are things that I hold very close to my heart. So they all just started sort of assimilating for me and stewing around and also wanting to heal the way we work. I had closed a business um, in 2019 that was just, uh, I don't even know how to, that's a whole other podcast episode, but it was not being a healing way to work for me is the short answer of it and probably for anyone. Um, and so just really wanting to not do that again and get curious about what my habits and expectations were that were not life-giving, that weren't mimicking what I was seeing in the natural world, like the experience of growing tomatoes one summer and realizing that two tomato plants can feed my whole block. It's like, okay, something is really wrong if we feel like we're running out of food, right? <laughs> uh, something is really, yes. really, really messed up if we think if that's what's happening. Because seeing the whole world around me just can't help but boom life at every opportunity. And yet what we're experiencing on a macro is a depletion of life. Like something is deeply fucked because can I cuss on your podcast? Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> something is deeply fucked if that is the case and really misaligned. And so just seeing that on such a small level and just like how tomatoes are te taught me about abundance and do teach me about abundance to where you just have so much that by August you're like, oh God, please no more tomatoes. Like I just can't handle how many keep on coming. And being like, well, why doesn't the way we work reflect that? Why do we feel like the earth is something that we have to conquer and tame? Why do we feel that we are things that we have to conquer and tame in order to experience abundance in a, which to me is just um, an overflowing cup that feels really alive um, and provided for and resourced when literally if we just leave like the backyard alone for like a week, it's just like bursting with so many new living things. And so wanting, you know, as we have, a lot of us have very online lives and online businesses. I mean, there needs to be a bridge there, right? It can't be like I go outside and use my garden for therapy. But then when I go to work, I like turn myself into something that is just like, you know, the monocrop corn farm that's like growing GMO bullshit. So, but that's what a lot of us do, right? We like harness ourselves and like, you know, whip ourselves over the back and we, we don't work in ways that feel supportive and abundant. So when I first started working with Notion a few years ago, it was a really profound shift for me because it felt like something was helping me hold all of my ideas of which there are many all the time. It feels like there's so many. Sometimes I just have to turn everything off because I'm like, I can't handle any more ideas. Oh, yeah. And it also felt like something was helping me hold my business. It was helping me organize how I'm like seeing things, um, organize projects, which I've always got like, I'm just like a project problem. I've always got, you know, I just love a project. And it felt like it took everything out of my backpack that when I sat down to work or I wanted to look at a particular thing that I could really unfold everything um, and then put it on for a while and work in it. But I didn't have to hold it all the time. I didn't have to, I didn't realize how much energy I was spending all day, every day, worried I was going to forget things. And that anxiety has largely disappeared, <laughs> um, which has been really amazing. It was taking up a lot of space. So I guess that's sort of how the two strands sort of like came around came about. And then realizing too, that I think I have, I'm a very creative person, but I'm also can be a very get shit done person, especially primarily being a dance artist where a lot of times your work culminates an event of some kind, which is a lot more to coordinate than being like, I made, not that it's better, but it's very different than like, I made a painting and posting it online for someone to buy. Like there's a lot more money, there's a lot more people, and there's a lot more things to hoosh together. So becoming a good project manager has been something that I've had to learn how to do. And again, 
how can I use that skill and add in what I'm learning from my garden, what I'm learning from the microbiome, what I'm learning from the more than human world and see that reflected in my work because it's not just about getting shit done. It's about how we get shit done. Otherwise, you know, we would be living in a very different society with very different systems. We need to be paying, I think, more attention to the how, um, in my opinion, because from my personal experience and my personal life, I've definitely run businesses and projects and things where I wasn't focused on the how I was just focused on getting to the next bit. And I kept being like, if I just hustle at this bit, if I just get to the, make this amount of money each month, if I just get to this, then it will magically feel different. But you know, if you plant potatoes, you don't magically get something else, right? So whatever we're planting all the time with our energy and our habits and how we work, that is what we're growing, which is another natural world thing. So I think those principles really tie in to how we can treat ourselves better and how we can use digital systems to help us do that. That is so cool. And yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm going to have to gather my thoughts. Sorry, I have a very well, non-sequential Right. No, I love it. Um, and I, I also, this is also how I, I communicate. It's just like, I, I remember there were a couple of things that I was like, oh, I should pull out this thread. And then I'm like, okay, but, you know, trying to kind of rein it in a little bit. The idea of the zone of genius, do you know that the Gay Hendricks mm -hmm. idea mm -hmm. and how I think when most people encounter that idea, uh, they think maybe back to at least the message I was receiving as a child, which was basically find the top thing you're good at and then do the hell out of that thing, basically so you can produce the most for the capitalist system possible, mm -hmm. right? Like if everybody's sort of maximizing and specializing in one thing. And what I love about the zone of genius idea is that if if you, you know, read that book or uh uh the, the book is The Big Leap. I think there's also a book called The Genius Zone, but the Big Leap is better. Mm -hmm. Just so people know. Um it's it's like how you work. It's what you're talking about. It's it's not like a job title or a type of work. It's like the specialized thing that you can do and sort of how you do it. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking of that as you were talking because it sounds like you have not, you know, narrowed down by the type of thing you're doing, but you do seem to be making choices and narrowing down based on how it feels to you and how it kind of fits into this holistic picture of what you want to do. And I think that's really beautiful because again, it's not the way that we're trained to think about work. I don't think certainly not how I was trained to think about work. Yeah, it's true. And I think for me, you're highlighting something that I hadn't really noticed, but it's more like there, for me, there's a decision-making framework more so than there is like a right and a wrong. Um, it's yeah. more like having filters and frameworks for how we make decisions about what's important. Um, and everyone's is going to be different. Um, and they will be different for us at different seasons of life. Do you mind reframing your, uh, not reframing, but just like reinstating your question for me? Yeah. I was, um, talking about how, like the, the, how you work and how things fit into this holistic framework seems more important to you than necessarily the specific activities or like the job title attached to it. Yeah, I think that's true. I think for me too, it comes back to that, mm, my primary impulse and mode being that of an artist, regardless of what I do, especially as someone, you know, a dance artist and I mean any artist, but dance is my primary medium. Just knowing how leaving room for mistakes, leaving room for experimentation is really important. And usually the process of making something, you go really wide and you try a lot of things that really, really don't work. Um, before you find that we're like, that's the moment, that's where we start, or we're going to cut basically everything we just spent three hours doing today because it was shit. And now we're going to keep this one little gem that we found. It took three hours to get here, but now we're going to keep this beautiful 60 seconds that we made. I really love it. And that being a totally normal way to make a totally normal way to be from my perspective and from my experience. And I think that in and of itself has been really valuable. I have because it's primary, it's prioritizing curiosity, it's prioritizing experimentation, it's prioritizing I don't know what's going to happen. And for me, there's also a sort of collaboration, it feels like, with what wants to be made. Like I'm making something, but I don't really see that as like I am exerting my will upon a Q1 goal that I must make happen at all costs. It's like the thing that I'm making also has something that it wants to be. And how can I get really good at listening to that? Um, and I would say that that is a mode through which I approach 
all the things. And I do tend to be a yes and person, um, which means I do bump up against my limits a lot where I realize like, oh, nope, you did too much. You took on too much. You need to scale it back. But I think too, I don't, not, can we not see that necessarily as a character flaw, but to know that that's a tendency and to also know that we have ebbs and flows. We have seasons where we go really big and we put a lot on our plate and we're doing things and then we pull really back and we ebb. And that's just a natural state of things. And I think that whatever we're doing, if we can give ourselves permission to do that is really powerful. And I also think too, that the longer, if you're multi-passionate, the longer you live, (laughs) the older you live, the more people you're going to know, the more things you're going to know about, the more people that you care about. And they don't all have to be your job. They don't have to all be ways that you make money. And I think for me, that's also been really freeing too, is just really letting ourselves detangle our purpose from the thing that gives us jobs. There's all sorts of things we have to do for work in the world. And those don't necessarily mean that they're your purpose. It doesn't mean that this is your gift. You're not a failure. If the thing you're doing for money isn't the thing that lights you up, sometimes life is just complicated and we have to pay some bills. And it doesn't necessarily say anything about you or who you are or your value or what your gifts truly are. You know, like making dances doesn't pay my bills. In a perfect world, does it? Absolutely. But it doesn't. And that doesn't mean I'm not yeah, that's not like showing me who I am as a failure at any point, right? It's just an area of friction um, that is asking me to get really creative about who I am and how I am and how my value gets communicated to the world as opposed to the framework that you were saying where it's like, pick the one thing that we're going to identify when you're eight years old, take all your AP classes in this, get really good scores because it's based on this narrative that if you do this, then this will happen. If you do this, then you'll get into a really good college. If you get into a really good college, then you'll meet all these people and then you'll get a really good job. If you get a really good job, then you'll make really good money and then meet a really good partner and then you'll have this perfect life. And it's just like, for me, I think for some people that works out okay. But for me, there's been a really big piece of it is just realizing like how life dances with me. And it's definitely not that way. It's like, I spent a great deal of my early life, following all of the rules, being as obedient as possible, being very good, being very polite, being very nice, and realizing that that actually didn't get me any of the things that it said it was going to. And so that framework really crushed for me, which brought a lot of grief and death and sadness at the time. But now I see it as really liberating because it's like, nope, following all the rules doesn't necessarily get you the thing that you want. So what are the rules? So can we at least look back and say, I don't regret how I did that because I can't control what is going to come from it. Not really. Mm, Right. Oh yeah. And I, I'm all about that. The process side of things, the, like what we can control and what we can do. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's so much around that. I was also thinking, you know, the pandemic really gave that experience of, uh, to I, I, definitely two entire generations, right? Millennials and Gen Z, I think both, we were just like, well, fuck. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, whatever those things were, those societally, you know, those, what you were saying about like, if I do this, then I will get this. Like, no matter what we were doing up until that point, for, uh, you know, again, a, a large portion of two generations, it's just like, nope, never mind. You know, that thing that you were working toward be it, you know, school graduation or a career thing, like whatever, or, you know, moving towards something for a lot of people the, it was just like, okay, never mind. Like the world's not going to give you that thing back, you know, anytime in the near future. And to me, that uncertainty pushed me back towards the natural rhythms and like looking at nature, thinking about nature in the ways that you've been talking about, partly because I was like, wait, to the extent that I have bought into these external systems that are not working and not serving everyone, uh, you know, to the extent that I've bought into those, they're being displayed so clearly as not working, Mm -hmm. right. In so many ways and across so many domains. And yeah, it really, it, it certainly pushed me in a different direction and there's, there's just, yeah, there's so much there. Yeah, there really is. And I think I feel grateful. I just recorded a podcast where we talked about sort of creativity is like practicing uncertainty. Mm. Um, I actually don't know how what this dance is going to look like yeah. after we do it. I love that. And so I think un- bringing us back to this prime primal reality of uncertainty in a world that we've constructed to be convenient at all costs can in the long run be some kind of gift of awakening 
I think, because again, it's like, it's reminding us that like the end can always be near. And I don't mean the end is in death, but I mean the end of whatever normal feels like today. You know, we don't really have any control over that, but can I do, can I do the how, can I do the process? Can I do the living in such a way that whatever happens tomorrow or changes tomorrow, I can look back and feel a sense of gratitude um, that I was awake enough to realize how what I had and be grateful for what I had, you know, as opposed to waiting for things to change or be gone or be sadder until I realized that. Yeah. And it's so like this seeming dichotomy between internal and external, like what we can do versus what, Mm -hmm. you know, is required externally to happen for us to get what we want. Essentially. I I think about this so much because so much of the self-help industry, which I'm technically in is about, you know, individuality, fix yourself, do stuff yourself versus, you know, what you said early on, that's, I a hundred percent agree with. It's like, we are built to be loved. We're built to receive touch and affection in a way that feels good for us, right? Like we are social mammals Mm -hmm. and we don't develop a sense of worthiness in isolation. Yeah. Isolation makes humans very broken. Yeah. I mean, and I mean like, you know, total complete isolation, obviously, like people like different amounts of aloneness, but aloneness is very different than isolation, I think. Yeah. I mean, even thinking about that, extending that to how we're connected to the more than human world, right? And the trees outside in the way that, you know, so many people don't, they don't even go outside anymore. You know, we spend our time as like surrounded by plastic and dress in synthetic fabrics and we look at the screen and then we eat, you know we eat some sort of processed food and I'm not judging any of these things, but I'm just listing them in a way that it, like we all do this. Right. And then, but also just experiencing each of those little things is an accumulation of disconnection, right? The trees want to be with us and we were made to be with them. We're made to be outside. We're made to hear the birds. We're made to bathe in the rivers. We're made to have our feet on the ground. Um, Even if we're just not even looking at this in an eco-spiritual way, but just like on a physiological level, our bodies don't repair if we don't have our feet on the ground and we're invited, we're made to be in connection with that, in love with that, in a relationship with that as well. And to feel held by that relationship and taught by its wildness and its seasons. And I think we continue to do ourselves a lot of harm on all the levels, like on just a level of like heartbreak that I think a lot of people can't quite understand or relate to or articulate sometimes, um, that sense of disconnection and we'll get, you know, even just seeing kids sometimes and just be like, oh my gosh, he's, this kid is acting crazy doing this thing. And I'm like, when was the last time he was like outside and like eating some real food and like just getting muddy out, you know, like when was the last time we were doing these very human things, which is not looking at an iPad for like five hours at a time, right? That isn't actually human on a really like fundamental level. And a lot of us have to do that nowadays, but how can we like facilitate these little returns to be like, oh yeah, I'm this. Oh yeah, I'm this. I'm just actually made to just like lay on the ground and like eat some grass and like look at the sky. Like that's actually what we're made (laughs) to do, right? And survive and and connect on this really fundamental level. I remember a few months ago, I just had this realization with a friend of mine and I was like, isn't it completely whack that we have like built these bubbles for ourselves where we like only interact with like concrete and humans. Like we don't interact with like animals, like on a day-to-day basis. Like, yeah, we'll like see a sparrow here and there, but it's not like we're interacting with like the wool, like the, the natural animals that inhabit our ecosystem. They're completely removed. We get in our cars, we drive, we experience the weather in a very remote way a lot of the time. And I just remember feeling that break in such a strong way, like wanting to feel the animals, um, in a in a much more close way, and in whatever ways we can invite ourselves back into um, a feeling okay that it's okay that we feel a loss somewhere, um, mm-hmm. and that there's nothing wrong with you if you feel like there's something wrong, <laughs> uh, which is something that I've had to reckon with. I was like, everyone told me it was just fine, and there was something wrong with how I felt. I'm like, no, I think I'm feeling appropriately, um, yeah. and. Then also just reminding ourselves that we are human, like you're saying, and how can we, like, we can't thrive in isolation. We can't thrive in this disconnect. So how can I gift that back to myself? Um, Even if it's just in like five minutes a day where I take my shoes off and stand in the grass. Yeah. And for real, as just like tiny practical things, if you want to connect to the earth more, three things that are super effective are literally barefoot 
on dirt or grass. So like connecting to the earth with bare feet, if you can, there's also getting your hands in dirt Mm -hmm. is also associated with like really positive health and happiness outcomes. So again, that could be a house plant, right? I will literally sometimes just stick my finger in my, in one of my house plants. I don't have like time to go outside. And then another one is getting uh, sunlight directly in your eyes with no glass in between. So I wear glasses. So, you know, like pushing my glasses down while I'm outside and just making sure, again, not staring at the sun. Okay. But like (laughs) getting, (laughs) getting direct sunlight in the eyes, um, especially the earliest you can in the day helps regulate melatonin production, which helps you sleep better. It also affects your sex drive. Fun fact. So people who spend like an extra 20 minutes a day in the sun, their sex drive like doubles sometimes. So that's another fun fact about melatonin. Let's just throw out there. I would like to wrap up. And my last two questions are, where can people find you? And we'll put all those links in the show notes. And then also, do you have any advice for yourself at another age? I am on the, I'm not on social media. So there's that, I think there might be a profile on Instagram, but I never, like, I don't have the app and I'll check. It's just like a weather vane at this point. So you can find me on my website at mgallardice.com or um, home-bodies.com. Those are the two things that I'm primarily up to right now. Um, And then the notion building things you can find through mgallardice.com. I haven't built out a website for that yet because it feels hard. So those are, and there's like newsletters um, through those, which are the best ways to stay in touch. And advice I would give to younger me. (laughs) <laughs> There's a lot of advice I would give to younger me. One would be don't date assholes. Um, I wish huh. that feels really obvious, but I remember the first time someone said that to me, it just, I was like a slap in the face. I was like, oh, you mean that's like an option? So that would be uh, one, a really practical one for anyone out there who's 24 and that you don't have to do that. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with you. It's okay to love what you love, how you love it. You are not too much. And you are also not too little, that you are deserving, that you don't, that the things that feel like life is really speaking to you, it's okay to latch onto those. They're trying to carry you somewhere. If there is something that you want and you feel like desire is just really strong around it, you're, you have desire for it because it wants you to. And so it's, it's trying to come to you just like you're trying to come to it. And those are things that I'll, I wish I knew and remembered when I was younger me. Oh, and you don't have to be good. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to be good. Oh, thank you. This is beautiful. And uh, if you ever write a book, I want it. <laughs> uh, Great. I will keep you posted. I'm working on it. So, <laughs> Yay. Thank you so much. And we will put all those things in the show notes, those links, and also the couple of books mentioned. We'll put those titles in the uh, link as well, just so you can find them. And go find Mary Grace on her website and check out her stuff because it's inspiring. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. It was lovely to be chatting with you today. So thank you. Thank you. And talk to you next week. Thanks for listening. If you know someone who would be helped by this podcast, please share it with them. And I'd love to hear your thoughts and suggestions at Mattia at MattiaMarie.com. That's M-A-T-T-I-A at M-A-T-T-I-A-M-A-U-R-E-E dot com. Thank you.